So you're doing your homework on the SER7, Sir7, from B-Link. Is it too good to be true? It's tiny, it's metal, it has a proprietary 19 volt connector, but there is actually a valid engineering reason you might want this kind of a connector over a barrel connector we'll talk about. Dual USB-C on the back, USB-C on the front, you can do power delivery, you can do display port. Can you do PCIe connectivity? USB, 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 2.5 gigabit, and it's tiny. It's RDNA 3. It's four nanometers? Let's take a closer look. Okay, if you've been following the mini PC craze for the last year or so, the 7000 series AMD CPUs are killing it. I'm not talking about AM5, I'm actually talking about the notebook processors. This is a notebook processor, not in a notebook, juiced to the max in terms of power delivery. And the more of these that I look at, the more impressed that I am. This particular model is 7840, eight cores, lots of horsepower, DDR5, 5600, out of the box. There's dual M.2 slots in here, one's empty, one is the built-in OS boot drive. You get DisplayPort, HDMI, and USB-C. Now that USB-C can also do DisplayPort, you just need a USB-C to DisplayPort adapter. It's the whole tunneling thing. So you can run two, three displays off of this thing, no problem, and still have your Type-A and your Type-C port at the front as well. Inside, if you pop the bottom off, it's super easy upgrade ready. There's an M.2 slot here. It's not two and a half inch, it's M.2. But you can slide your M.2 in, pop it in. There's an auxiliary fan here for cooling. This is dual sodium. You don't really want to take it apart much more than this because it's a uh, liquid metal, but you can pop the screws off here to replace the M.2 boot drive, as well as upgrade the memory configuration if you want. Our configuration here shipped with 32 gigabytes of memory. Before we get this thing booted up and running our benchmarks, let's take a look at the accessories in the box. First, the power brick with the funky connector is almost larger than the device itself. 19 volts at just over five amps. It's gonna be north of 100 watts. Also in the box, you have a very short HDMI cable and a more reasonable length HDMI cable, as well as a Visa mounting adapter bracket. So what, what it is, this metal plate screws into the bottom of the B-Link, which then screws into the Visa holes in the back of your monitor. And then you can mount this thing to the back of a monitor and have an all-in-one type machine. This is really cool. I've showed this before. This is not really anything new. What is kind of new from B-Link is this sort of round flat connector. It could possibly become a standard. The reason that a DC barrel adapter like what you have on a laptop is perhaps undesirable is that if you rotate the barrel connection, it can... Uh, intermittently have a better or worse connection to the machine in question. At lower wattages, like typical laptop wattages, it doesn't really matter, but more and more laptops demand more power, so they end up having more power filter circuitry. If you have this kind of a connector, where it's not going to move around very much, you need less of that kind of filtering circuitry. That's really the only thing that I can possibly think of that maybe this type of connector makes more sense over the more standard DC barrel type connector. I mean, certainly there are laptops that are high wattage that have a barrel type connector, but those laptops are probably also built with a power circuit that will deal with the noise induced by rotating the barrel connector in its connector, which is a thing that happens. So I guess, okay, maybe this will become a standard. Maybe not, I don't know. But as a backup plan, it does do USB-C power delivery. All right, in terms of baseline benchmarks, out of the box, <laughs> DDR5600, it's okay. It means it's going to be stable, but it's unremarkable memory timings, so we're talking about a latency of about 91 nanoseconds. For many PCs, this is great, but think about an AM5 tuned desktop. Your latency at this point, in the very latest Giza, is going to be uh, more along the lines of 60, 70 nanoseconds. That's a pretty significant savings, but most of the time, you really only benefit from the dramatically faster memory when everything else in the system is also dramatically faster. There's no dedicated GPU here. You're relying on the built-in APU RDNA 3, which is no slouch. It's great for streaming. It's got built-in 
uh, hardware encode decode for a bunch of different codecs, it can work. I would like to see something faster in terms of timing, but yeah, it is what it is. It's also 5620, not 5600, which tells me that B-Link has juiced things just a little bit. That is a very, very slight overclock, but it doesn't seem to uh, sacrifice stability in the least. This is also an APU configured for 45 watts. Their kilowatt meter here, we're seeing peak power draws of about 75 watts for desktop type tasks. When you're doing desktop and, type, and gaming type workloads with a fully loaded configuration, you can exceed 100 watts as reported by the kilowatt, which makes sense and is well within the parameters of what our power brick and the power delivery system um, can deliver. So nothing unusual there. Our CPU Z single and multi core score, of course, is pretty respectable. Eight cores, 16 threads, 32 gigabytes of DDR5 memory. This is an extremely impressive little platform. This actually will run circles around two, three year old full desktop systems, all but the, 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 the highest end enthusiast desktops from a few years ago. A business class desktop from two or three years ago, uh, this, is, this is considerably faster. And it's gonna feel faster just because of the single core scores. I mean, Okay, awesome. The built-in SSD is nothing to write home about. It's the crucial P3, CT1000 P3 uh, SSD8. It's the OEM name for their Gen 4 one terabyte. Pretty decent SSD. It's not gonna set the world on fire, but it is faster than the fastest Gen 3 drives. So about five gigabytes per second read speed. Again, entirely respectable pretty awesome that it's a Gen 4 drive. This SSD uses the Fison PS5021E21T 4-channel controller. It's a Micron 176 layer SSD. They're, they do something interesting here with 64 megabytes of, of memory. Like most of the time the memory is not actually a cache, but there is 64 megabytes of SLC-like cache. It's a special sauce thing that Fison and Micron have done to make everything go faster. That said, this is a this is a QLC SSD, which means that the writes will quench fairly quickly. So if you're doing something like a memory card offload and you're offloading more than say 100 gigabytes of pictures at a time, you know you're going to copy it to your computer and you're going to do some image processing and then copy it to a NAS kind of thing. Uh, you will quench the write cache on the SSD if it's more than a little bit full, more than 20 or 30% full with that kind of an operation. So basically the fuller the drive is, the slower it gets, and you're gonna notice more because this is a QLC drive rather than a TLC drive. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that if you're thinking, wow, my drive's 80% full and I'm noticing that it seems like it's slowed down. That's not just you, that's just how those drives work. To be more precise than that though, this drive is one of the best in its class of affordable SSDs. They didn't cut any corners. The quality of the NAND is good and all of those. So as a drive in a productivity machine, it's a perfectly reasonable logical choice. It's just there are much higher end systems. So if you're, even if you're thinking about buying this as like an eSports thing, I'm going to play eSports games. I mean, for reads, yeah, that kind of stuff is basically okay, but if you're constantly cycling through games in your Steam library, it might be worth getting that second SSD. Crucial says that the write speed of this drive is going to be up to about 5 gigabytes per second, like the read speed, but real world, after I've cycled this drive with, you know, basically filling it up and emptying it and filling it up and emptying it about three times, well, our write speed is down to about 3.5 gigabytes per second. And this is at 60% capacity, so it's not terrible. It's just okay. Our Geekbench score is very, very impressive. This is Geekbench 6.1, so we're looking at over 2,500 for our single core sc score, and that means we're, <laughs> we're at almost 12,000 points for our multi-core score. And keep in mind, this is at a system that is running at a TDP of 45 watts about 100 watts from the wall or less in almost all scenarios. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is basically a pretty good stand-in for AAA-ish games, 1080p low, average FPS 33. Not bad, not bad for an APU. If you drop down to 720, or you use uh, upscaling technology like FSR, you can achieve 45, 50 FPS with a free sync monitor. It's actually playable. I'd still rather stream from a better gaming machine though. 
Oh, and one last note in case you're annoyed by the lack of USB or other ports on a mini PC like this. Don't forget there are inexpensive USB-C breakout adapters. These are usually used with laptops. They often have pass-through power delivery, can give you a second network port, can give you a ton of extra type A ports, USB-C, 10 gigabit to a bunch of these, or even a Thunderbolt dock will work with this. So you've got a lot of options to add yet more connectivity if you don't have enough USB ports or other connections, depending on what you're looking for. I mean, I'm connecting my HDMI monitor through the USB-C port, plus also extra type A, USB, etc., etc. Now you wouldn't want to do this with a gaming display or a high refresh display, but if it's a secondary or an informational monitor, this is fine. And you've got the onboard display port full size and the onboard HDMI, but I just wanted to show you that you can get these in all kinds of different port configurations. So no matter what sort of weird thing you were looking to do, you can do it through the USB Type-C connections. So RDNA 3 for gaming, it's weird. If it's in a portable or a handheld, it's really good. If it's in a desktop mini PC, it's really good as long as you're sticking to eSports titles or older games. I mean, you can get 30-ish FPS in PUBG at 1080p on low and other games. It's not bad, but I would still prefer a different mini PC that has a built-in dedicated GPU, even if it's weak, if that makes sense. Because even a built-in weak dedicated GPU is still going to be better than an APU. But for Steam streaming from another gaming machine, this is very good. Very low latency, hardware decode, all the fixings can work well. If this is a parent's machine, grandparent's machine, friend of the family, guest room computer, some computer that's dedicated for a specific task, then that works really well. Also, these machines have gotten so cheap for things like paying your taxes and online banking and that sort of thing. As a security measure, having an entirely separate machine for that makes a lot of sense. Maybe not one this nice. You can get a lesser model that's way less expensive and use that for your online banking and paying your taxes and anything that's critically important. And only that and having that level of separation is really, really nice from a security perspective. Having a machine that's you know, not networked or only very lightly networked for your password manager or like the, the password manager's password manager where only certain passwords are stored for certain critically important things. This is the world that we are living in now. Like I say, this machine's maybe a little too nice to do that with, but if you think in those terms, then you can start to think how you can fill your life with lots and lots of mini PCs. For off-label uses, things like running Home Assistant or a home server or something like that, you should take a look at this machine's big brother from B-Link, which has dual two and a half gig. It's physically a little larger, a little bit more connectivity, a little bit more horsepower. It's juiced a little more in terms of power. I think something like that for the higher end would uh, probably interest you, or at least be worth a look. The only real dark side of these mini PCs, especially the AMD mini PCs based around the 7000 series CPUs, is there's this kind of no man's land with driver support and BIOS updates. Virtually none of the mini PC vendors provide you know, an updated BIOS after the fact, or at least a historical track record for the 6000 and so far the 7000 series APUs from AMD is that you're basically on your own. It sort of puts AMD in a tough spot. Is AMD going to chase down how all the different people that build with this build and then provide a unified driver? They've kind of painted themselves into a corner. AMD is going to get the reputation hit, I think, because you can't just go to AMD's website and download the drivers for these. And it's kind of true with laptops as well. If you have a 7840 or a 78, uh, well, it's pretty much any 7000 series mobile driver, it's very hit and miss as to whether you can download the file from AMD's website and have it not wreck everything. That's not specific to B-Link. That's true of many, but not all, 7000 series system drivers. I think AMD probably has some guidelines for how you should implement the 7000 series chip. And if you stick to that, then their drivers will work. But if you don't, then uh, the drivers will kind of work, but they potentially will break things on the system. Uh, for example, on the, the bigger brother system of this, the fingerprint scanner sort of gets wrecked if you install the AMD website version. But you can download the drivers from B-Link. So it's weird. It's a weird situation in terms of what is and is not supported. 
That's really the darkest thing about these. I like the cooling solution on this with the liquid metal. Uh, the worst temperatures that we saw were under 80 degrees C, which is well below, I mean, in laptops, it's gonna be a suboptimal cooling situation, blah, blah, blah. For the cooling that this chip was designed for, this is more than adequate cooling. At arm's length, the noise that this thing makes at idle and on the desktop is below the noise floor of my, uh, my studio, not really super professional audio testing environment. Subjectively, at arm's length, when this thing is running full tilt, 3D mark, you know, maxing out the GPU and the CPU, it is audible, but it's more of a whoosh sound than a, uh, than a whiny sound. I prefer the whoosh sound to the whiny sound, and tuning the fans is it's not always tricky. I would like to see the design evolve into a single fan design, having the fan in the bottom and the top is a little annoying because there's, you know, you've doubled the chances that you might have some mechanical problem at some point in the future. But the fan in the bottom is designed to overcome the fact that, well, DDR5 memory, even at 5600, it's going to run pretty toasty. And we've also got one, perhaps two M.2 in here. And there's not enough passive airflow from the top fan cooling the CPU, sucking air in through the bottom in order to be able to cool the one or two M.2 plus your DDR5. So I get why it was just, ah, let's add another second fan to deal with this. I think probably a smarter motherboard design in the future, or maybe this is an AMD engineering thing that they could do, a larger, slower fan that cools everything in the top probably makes more sense than two smaller fans. Just engineering 101. I don't think it's terrible. It's just something to keep in mind. But in terms of performance and where we are, I can't believe how fast the mini PCs are in general. And I can't believe that we're at a point where 8, 12, 14 cores in mini PCs, depending on whether you swing, you know, Team Blue or Team Red, as this one is, uh, is kind of the norm. But as we've seen from modern game releases and modern application releases, basically everything these days can use 6, 8 cores, no problem six, eight cores for just desktop mundane uses, a lot of browser tabs, switching back and forth between applications, 32 gigabytes of memory. That's where we are in 2023. And even more than eight cores might be nice, but these eight cores are generally faster than the 12 and 14 core things that are available uh, from, from Intel. So this is going to perform better. This 7,000 series mobile APU uh, that this is based around generally will perform better and especially performs better in the 45-ish watt power envelope. Now, 45 watt TDP, power draw at the wall, 100 watts, worst case scenario, 75 watts nominal. Ah, uh, it's just, it just depends on how you count that number. You know me, off-label uses. PCIe tunneling, as it's called in the AMD platform, means that we may be able to plug in a Thunderbolt dock. Thunderbolt, confirmed working. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. PCIe tunneling confirmed working. What this means is that yes, you could upgrade your GPU. Keep in mind it's limited to PCIe 3 four lanes, so you're not going to upgrade it much. You really shouldn't use an external GPU anything faster than like an RX 6600, 7600 maybe. You're going to pretty severely bottleneck through that connection, but it is an option. For the home lab use case, use a Thunderbolt 10 gigabit network card or use the Thunderbolt port for a direct crossover connection as we recently did in my video. Except that the Thunderbolt net driver is not quite complete on the AMD side. You'll have to patch the module. You can come to the forum and get that up and running. But it does work. You just got to add some devices to your table of stuff that Thunderbolt net runs over. You got to be careful on the AMD platforms too because not necessarily every USB-C port is capable of Thunderbolt tunneling. I think strictly speaking the platform only supports two such ports. It didn't like it when I switched to the other rear USB-C port and said there wasn't enough resources in the system. So I'm gonna reboot and see if that works. And of course, Windows Update. And much to my surprise, the second USB-C port on the rear does also function for PCIe tunneling. However, it was a weird and quirky experience. Sometimes in the second USB port, when you were rebooting the machine, it would just hang on a black screen. And sometimes when shutting it down, it would just hang on a black screen. It didn't do that with no, with the external GPU enclosure not attached to the system. And I think, but I'm not sure this is down to the Thunderbolt security model. So in the old days, you would just plug something in and it could do whatever it needed to do. 
It turns out that wasn't great from a security standpoint because if you plugged in a malicious device, it could steal memory from the host computer, including encryption keys and everything else under the sun that it shouldn't have access to. So later versions of Thunderbolt eventually, sort of, kinda, implemented security. And that I don't think has been super bug free on any platform. And I think that when the system boots with a Thunderbolt PCIe tunneling device attached to it, uh, it doesn't always get the security settings right. It always seemed to work better plugging it in after the fact and letting Windows find it. Uh, that said, there is an app in the uh, Microsoft Store called Thunderbolt Control Center. Although if you search for it on an unsupported system, it goes to great lengths to hide it from you. And if you just use Google instead, and install it that way, then you can install it from the Microsoft App Store. This is, by the way, why it has like a one, one and a half star rating because the Microsoft App Store is absolutely worthless and has a bunch of garbage applications on it in addition to applications that are actually useful. What this Intel utility does is it lets you set the security settings. Normally this is only for an Intel platform, but I thought, hey, let's give it a try on the AMD platform. Turns out, uh, not really a thing. The B-Link BIOS doesn't expose the settings for PCIe tunneling security. There should be a BIOS setting that just says, yeah, let's go with the no security option. It doesn't give you the option. And the AMD utilities for the platform for PCIe tunneling to do that, also not done yet. It's supposed to be plug and play. Uh, it can be plug and play if you're willing to be a little experimental, but you can use an external GPU dock if you're willing for it to be uh, slightly rough around the edges, but it can work. And more importantly, two ports. So if you're willing to get your hands dirty on the Linux side of things, you can build a three node cluster where every node's connected to every other node. See my other video. <laughs> or maybe look out for that video on the Linux channel featuring the Sur 7 and some other small form factor machines that have dual Thunderbolt, uh, dual PCIe tunneling devices. But overall, metal design, solid engineering from B-Link. I like what I see. Not really a lot to complain about. I'm Waddle, this is level one. This has been a quick look at the SER7. If you think of any fun uses that you want to see with this, let me know.